Hey there, and welcome to episode 10 of LOCAD TV. In today's episode, we're going to be discussing those everyday devices, which when connected to the internet become smart. Now these go by the rather ambiguous title of the Internet of Things. Nowadays, we're living in a truly interconnected world, where the range of devices being embedded with software and sensors is seemingly growing by the day. Now this increase in connectivity undoubtedly has its benefits. In Shenzhen, in China, um, the installation of 40,000 smart cameras across the city saw the crime rate slashed by over 50%. However, these everyday devices can be hacked. At best, the hackers might be using the device to create information for targeted ad advertising campaigns. However, at worst, these loopholes can be used for service level attacks, which have been used in the past to take down entire countries banking systems, such as happened in Estonia in 2007. So Johannes, with a buzzword like Internet of Things, it's very vague, it's very vague sounding. So perhaps we can start things off with a bit of an example here. Yes, I mean, first, Internet of Things is just a trend of um, computing power being cheaper over time. So, you know, um, a couple of years ago it was, it became cheap enough so that you could have a computer in your pocket, that's your smartphone, and the trend is still ongoing and now it, it becomes so cheap that you can actually put a computer on pretty much anything and it will, for many things that are not like super cheap already, it will barely change anything on the price of that thing. So where can we put actually computers? Where well, we can put computers on cars. We have like, cars are pretty expensive, so they have like literally dozens of, of, of uh, microprocessors and, and smart processing power on board already. But um, you can do that on uh, objects that are uh, typically to control your, the temperature of your home. You can do that, um, you can have like uh, IP cameras that are actually just only require an internet connection and then they can upload their video stream to whatever, you know, online service of your, of your choosing. Uh, and, and more recently we have seen a trend with, um, with, with, I would say, smart devices like Amazon Echo where you can just have something that can be used to listen to, listen to music, but if you actually say, um, uh, uh, you can give a voice command out loud, um, Amazon Echo, just buy me uh, um, um, this song or whatever, it will actually proceed directly on the, uh, uh, with uh, taking order and, and processing it so that it can happen uh, in real life and, and where you can actually acquire the, the, the things you, that you just ordered. So if we look at it from sort of a human being perspective, how is it really changing how we're interacting with these objects? Um, I think it can make those objects, I would say, more, more capable in, in many ways, so that they have um, you know, self-diagnosis capabilities so that if you want to do a, a repair, I mean, ma many, for example, many objects are getting smarter so now. Most printers will give you a readable diagnosis if something goes wrong and it's directly displayed on the printer. Most printers can now be uh, you know, attached to a network and then whoever access to this local network can print on the printer. You don't necessarily need to plug the printer on your computer. So it's not like, um, it's plenty of objects. Obviously a printer was already you know, a, a powered device, but, uh, but you can think of it for like a, an enterprise coffee machines where you might have some repair uh, to be performed and the thing is capable of self-diagnosing and triggering you know, a, a maintenance, a scheduled maintenance operation on its own instead of waiting for the problem to happen. So it's, it's plenty of objects that were already maybe powered, uh, can get, you know, can be augmented with um, IoT capability. But also you can think of, um, from I would say a supply chain perspective, you can also uh, add, I would say, IoT capabilities to objects that were not typically self-powered like, like pallets or parcels, just so that you have like better tracking systems in place that can directly uh, feed information to um, the headquarters about the status of this particular object, parcel, truck, etc. Okay, so adding it to pallets and parcels and trucks, that's kind of looking at things from a sort of a supply chain perspective. Yes. So where do you see sort of the real potential for supply chains with the Internet of Things? I mean, it's, 
I think one of the biggest challenge of supply chains is to deal with um, a world that is vast, where you have plenty of assets that are moving, that are uh, and that need to serve like um, that, that, are, that need to serve clients who have needs, and it's very hard to have like very tight, I would say even real time coordination on everything at I would say global scale. So IoT is a possibility to have um, to have like. Uh, at an active tracking on every single pallet, every single truck, every single parcel, and you know exactly where they are and where they have been over, you know, for their entire life cycle. So, for example, um, it's not just about having, uh, I would say, the, the location. For example, if you add a tr um, uh, an IoT tracker to, let's say, a pallet, you can track um, temperature so that you know, for example, if the temperature has been, uh, has been controlled for the entire duration of the transportation. You can track acceleration with an accelerometer so that you know if you know, your goods have suffered shocks uh, that would maybe damage them to some extent. Um, you, you can have like smart security measure to monitor the physical integrity of a seal, you know, on, uh, again, to make sure that uh, maybe what, your transport, what, your, what is being transported has not been tampered with. Um, uh, so, so it's, it's, I would say, plenty of capabilities that, that are already being done today with, I would say, really, uh, I would say, simple, I would say, less technological approaches, but with IoT becoming like super cheap. When I say super cheap, I mean, you, if you have the possibility to attach a full computer with all, you know, internet capabilities for just like a couple of dollars, like a single digit number of dollars, like a, a computer for $5, suddenly, I mean, it, it, the question becomes, what can I do with this computer that I can attach on pretty much everything? Because it's, it's, it's actually so cheap that maybe by default you can attach this sort of uh, computing capabilities to pretty much everything. Um, so the thing I'm really sort of missing here is where's the external power coming from? Because you've got microprocessors and microcomputers being attached to every single one of your pallets. Um, so where's the actual power for that coming from? Don't they need to be charged up? Or Yes. So here that's, there is a very, very clever trick that has been, I would say, uh, inherited from the progress made on mobile devices, um, uh, mobile phones, sorry, is that you, your, um, your IoT device does not need to be powered all the time. It can go in sleep mode and then wake up, let's like, say, once per minute, just do some processing for a tenth of a second, send a pulse across the network, and then go back to sleep. And when you do that, you can uh, preserve the energy of your battery for a much longer period of time. Actually, uh, modern IoT devices, if you don't demand too much from them, they can ha their, their battery can last for one or two years. So suddenly, if your device is just a couple of dollars and you want to track something that is relatively expensive, then um, the, the, the IoT device just become a, a consumable. You know, you, 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 you take it from the factory, batteries included, it will have uh, an operating life of, let's say, two years, and then at the end of the uh, at the end of its of its life, you're just going to dispose of it uh, to put it for recycling. So that's that's how you do not have to manage, um, uh, I would say, external power. It's self-powered, and it lasts for literally for 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 for, for months and possibly for years. Is that not a bit wasteful? I mean, the environment is such a huge consideration nowadays that just sort of throwing away microcomputers after you sort of use them is that not a bit of a, a waste? I mean, like like many things. Uh, Supply chains consumes a lot of consumables. You know, you have all this packaging that you need to put around the goods that you want to ship. Otherwise, those goods get broken. Uh, they are also consumed, and they, so they need to be recycled. Um, consumer electronics, in, in, in general, are fairly easy to recycle. So I think, plus, we are literally talking of, of grams of materials. So it's, it's, it's very light. So in terms of, I would say, Overall environmental impact, it's, it's just, uh, I mean, it, it, it's, it's very, very, very thin just because it's so small, so light, and plus, it's, if done properly, it can be recycled almost entirely. Okay, so let's sort of talk about now the data that these microprocessors are kind of producing. Can that data be very easily implemented into existing ERP systems? 
Uh, that's probably one of the biggest challenge is that um, indeed a, a, an IoT fleet can generate massive amount of data. I mean, each device itself is not going to generate, you know, gigabytes of data. But because you have so many devices, uh, the aggregation of all the data that you collect is typically massive. I mean, it's typically one or two orders of magnitude more than um, I would say the typical transactional data that you were historically collecting into an ERP. So indeed, that's a challenge, uh, and it requires different our, um, IT strategies to process this data. Uh, for example, all the NoSQL movement, you know, those, those which is basically which basically mean not only SQL databases. Uh, that can process a lot more data in a, in a in much more scalable way. Um, um, you typically need some kind of big data capabilities to to aggregate all those IoT generated data and process them. And it doesn't necessarily fit into your historical architecture of your I would say your transactional ERP world. So it 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 requires I would say some extensive support from the IT. To be to the IT department to roll out all the um, the components that are needed, typically on the cloud to support the IoT the IoT uh, fleet on the ground. So, are there any companies that are currently using IoTs? Are there any companies that have sort of overcome this hurdle to do with data? Yes, there is uh, Amazon. I would say who has been like a pioneer. Uh, I think it's. Uh, it's not, um, you, can, you can see, I mean, the, the, uh, Jeff Bezos is extremely impressive in his long-term th thinking. I mean, back in 2002, he had a, a very famous memo where he wanted Amazon to go to a, um, like a, 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 um, a service-oriented architecture, which, wa which is actually a very, very good choice if you want to have like some services that are dedicated to, to um, scalable event streaming, just like what you need with an IoT fleet. Then they went with, um, they acquired Kiva Systems, wh which puts basically, it's, uh, it's IoT in the sense that you, suddenly you have to track like hundreds of robots self-powered in your warehouse. So, and, and you want to, 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 to process all these data so that you can have like centralized coordination for maximal, to maximize basically the, the throughput of your warehouse. And, uh, and, and now they are pushing further, I would say, the boundary of supply chain with, um, with, um, uh, with their dash button, which is um, maybe so from, for TV viewers who are not very familiar. The dash button is a device that you can buy from Amazon. You put it it's a, on a magnet on your fridge. And it's a button, and if you press the button, it will trigger a purchase of, um, of one extra uh, piece of the, the, the product that is associated to to the dash button. So uh, yes, there are pioneers that are moving, that are, I would say, doing very aggressive things with IoT nowadays, but they are still, they are still I would say, there are still very few of them. They are, they are really the, the pioneers of our time. I believe the, the rest of the market will follow, but it will take time. It's definitely uh, quite an interesting prospect that in the future, instead of doing a supermarket shop, I can just open my fridge and press a few buttons and it's all going to be delivered for me. So other than the data, um, are there any other sort of hurdles that are blocking the adoption of IoTs? Yes. Um, I think the second biggest challenge after um, upgrading your IT infrastructure to cope with the extra data is uh, security. You see, those, the problem with those, those IoT devices is that they are fundamentally at risk a lot more uh, than, I would say, computers that are sitting in a data center, which is a very well-protected facility. Uh, here, um, and, uh, and the IoT devices can be hacked. And actually, this is one of the m massive concerns nowadays with, let's say, IP cameras, is that the largest botnets that just wreak havoc over the internet are actually built from rogue IT cameras that have been hacked and that are, that are being taken advantage of by literally criminals to, to, carry, to, to, to carry attacks. So I think the second, the second largest concern for, I would say, supply chain companies who want to, to, to go into IoT to upgrade their supply chain would be to, to, to basically implement like defense in depth to make sure that their fleet of 
devices do not get hacked and corrupted and redirected to wreak havoc um, in the internet or in the real world for, 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 for uh, completely, I would say, defeating the purpose of introducing all those smart devices in, in, in the network in the first place. So what you're describing here sounds a little bit too close to a kind of a black mirror storyline. Um, perhaps you could sort of define for our viewers kind of what you meant by a botnet. What does that actually mean? Yes. So um, if you have access to, let's say, one million computers uh, for free, you can do a lot of things, mostly bad things, on, on the internet. So what sort of things uh, can you do? And by the way, criminal organizations are doing that nowadays. So, it's, it's, uh, uh, so it's, it's organized crime nowadays. So basically, what, what do you do? Um, you can take control of those machines, and you can use those machines who benefit from internet connection to just try to connect to a website. They just try to download your homepage. The point is that if you have like one mil you see, in, over the internet, you cannot see if it's a real person or a machine. Uh, it's not when, when there is a page that is downloaded, it's not you, the human, who is downloading the web page. It's your computer that downloads the web page for you. So fundamentally, if you are having, you know, you have your company website and you just want to serve the home page to all the machines that request the home page, you cannot really differentiate between if it's a real human sitting behind, you know, a computer or just a computer being part of a botnet. And as a result, if you know, um, a criminal has access to one million machines, they can actually request a page or web page simplifying uh, the situation um, from a server. And if there is many, many machines, they can operate what is called a denial of service attack, where the, 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 the website gets overloaded and nobody can access this website. And then the criminal organization is going to come and say, well, we can make the problem stop if you actually buy our protection from, if you buy protection from us, you know, that's very mafia-like uh, process. So it's, it's literally a ransom. And uh, so basically this is um, ransoming companies is one way of, of uh, actually uh, uh, making money for criminal organization. And uh, IoT, Internet of Things, are prime targets uh, because they are typically loosely uh, protected uh, and they have internet connectivity. So you have all the ingredients to be like good uh, ingredient for, for botnets. But it's, you, you can even think of worse attacks, actually. So before we get too far down the line of how to hack these objects, before we get into too much trouble for those sort of things, perhaps you can sort of define to us how we can actually secure these objects. How can we ensure that they're actually safe? So it's... Uh, <laughs> it's unfortunately, I would say, a very complex problem. I mean, when you, when you see that even, for example, Intel had security flaws in their CPUs that have been you know, lingering around. I'm referring to Spectre and Meltdown that were just uncovered earlier this year that have been lingering around on regular computer processors for like two decades without anybody really noticing that the security flaws were there. So it's, Fundamentally, it's, it's the whole problem of, of doing like secure computing. How do you ensure that you have like a perfect control of a, a, a computing device, um, that the integrity of this device cannot be compromised? But there are some, some basic element, which is uh, uh, first, I mean, you, you, you need to have like um, um, the, code, the source code needs to be audited. You need to have people who actually try to break the device to see if they succeed. If they do not succeed, it's a good, uh, you know, if, if nobody has ever tried to break into the device, you are never really sure that it's actually, you know, uh, secure. For example, there is many um, vendors like technology vendors who have uh, what it's called bounty programs, where basically they say, whoever managed to break into my IoT device or my software in general, is going to have um, to, to, to receive a, a five thousand dollar bounty for every breach that they can find. So suddenly you have it gives like an incentive at large to the good guys. So the people who are like the the what it's called that uh, the white hats. You know you have like the black hack hackers who are basically like criminal organizations who want to break into things to literally make money. Uh, uh, by the fact that they have gained power of a, a computing system. And you have the white hats who just want to do that to 
makes the system more secure. So if you have like a Bantry program that uh, give people um, uh, an incentive, good people an incentive to actually work and try to help you uh, secure your own IoT fleet or your own computer system in general. So there are, there are many, many ways. It's, 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 not like a, it's not like a simple problem that has a one solution, but basically if you do not invest in the security of your IoT uh, deployments, you should not expect those IoT deployments to be secure in the first place. Okay, I definitely like this idea of good guy hackers. I mean, that's nice that we've got some of the good guys and the bad guys, yes. that's quite funny. Um, so to sort of wrap things up, IoTs definitely sound like they've got a lot of potential, um, but they've also got a lot of hurdles to sort of overcome as well. So how do you see things in sort of the near future? Can you see these really sort of being something that we're gonna be using every day as of next year, or how do you see the future working? So the funny thing is that the future is already there. Uber, what, what Uber does is IoT at scale with human drivers because they don't have autonomous vehicles yet. But you see, uh, in terms of supply chain, what is Uber doing? They have like IoT trackers, which conveniently are the smartphones of, the, uh, of their drivers, so they don't even have to pay for the IoT device. Somebody is paying the IoT device for them, installing the app, and then they, they track the position of every single of their asset, which Every vehicle is an asset part of the Uber network. And then they have like this, this uh, overall control systems where they can uh, dispatch you know, demand to the closest drivers and provide incentives to drivers to be present at certain times in certain locations. So for me, uh, Uber is already like an IoT network. I mean, obviously it has, it, it has um, it has an ingredient of, of involving like a social network of, of drivers that have, that have rating, et cetera. But fundamentally, if you just think of what Uber will look like as soon as you have autonomous vehicles, it will be just like a, a gigantic IoT network in the real life with uh, moving assets, supply chain speaking. So, uh, and the very same thing is already happening with autonomous trucks, by the way, Uber has also uh, opened the first completely autonomous uh, truck line that just travel across the US. Um, so uh, I think in the next coming years, we will see a lot of things on the, um, around autonomous vehicles, but also uh, probably in terms of traceability. I mean, if, if there are, uh, I think more than ever, counterfeits are uh, problems. But traceability is not also about counterfeits. You want to also ensure the integrity of your, of your products across all the chain. So the interesting thing about IoT, if you want to think that you can have you know, an, a, a, a tracking device attached to every single container, every single pallet, every single box, as long as you're moving things that have some, some value. I mean, if, if you're just moving sand around, you don't care about having like um, advanced tracking through IoT. But if you're tracking, let's say, vaccine or um, consumer electronics or luxury goods or, you know, um, moderately ex expensive fashion goods, etc., cetera, um, it, is, it is of very high interest to monitor that your entire chain is very safe, that integrity is preserved, that you have like a complete traceability and complete, I would say, real-time update information about everything that is within your supply chain. Um, so I think we will see more and more of that and smart companies, I mean, Amazon is definitely, I would say, ahead of the pack, but there will be, there will be challenge, will take advantage of this, those real-time insights down to the location of every single palette to be very, very smart about um, their supply chain uh, uh, operations so that they, they become more agile, they can literally change their mind halfway through a delivery to say, okay, I was this morning, three hours ago, I was planning to deliver this part to this location, but I realized that plans have changed and uh, there is an emergency here and I need, for example, for an, if we were like, let's say in aerospace, it is like an AOG, a craft on ground problem. You would say, okay, real time alert. I need this part for another aircraft that is um, just the other side of the airport and I'm going to just redirect a shipment that is in progress 
uh, by notifying live, you know, whoever uh, or uh, whatever vehicle is carrying these parts. Um, I believe this, those, those things are coming and probably uh, uh, in terms of bottleneck, I believe that probably most of the bottlenecks will be um, the, the implementing the change in IT and implementing the change in organization so that it becomes acceptable to have this sort of new ways of, of operating the supply chain. Okay, sounds good. Well, as long as it's being implemented correctly and we don't have a big sort of black mirror scenario happening yes. anytime soon. But uh, yeah, thanks for another really interesting discussion. So uh, that's all for this week, but uh, we'll be back again next week with yet another episode. Until then, we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.